Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Community Exchange Podcast brought to you by OpenWeb. On this podcast, we're tracking the development and growth of the community economy, the emerging economic engine of the open internet. Here, we talk to leaders in media, tech, trust, and beyond who are bringing it to life. Joining me today is Angela Johnson. Angela is the Client Development Officer at Dentsu. Angela believes brands have the power to influence consumer behavior for the better, and she works to ensure brands use that power to the fullest extent possible. We cover a lot on this episode, from diversity, equity, and inclusion, to reducing carbon footprints and ensuring that every ad a consumer sees is fraud-free and brand safe. All of these, obviously, initiatives that are necessary for the growth of the community economy. Uh, in addition to her work at Dentsu, Angela has served as the chair of the 4A's Business Leadership Committee and is currently the Secretary Board of Directors at the Oasis Consortium, uh, a nonprofit dedicated to promoting trust and safety on the web. I'm really excited for our discussion today uh, with Angela, so let's get on to the interview. Uh, Angela and Dale, welcome to the Community Exchange. Angela, you're the Client Development Officer at Dentsu. To start, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your role, and the kind of work you're involved in at Dentsu? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, yes, I'm a part of the solutions team at Dentsu in the headquarters here in North America, working with clients to help them grow in a sustainable and responsible way through buying their media for them, creating their content. Uh, I lean in on a few clients more than others, uh, Kroger, Diageo, Subway, Microsoft, and Nestle. But apart from just working with clients, I think the thing that I love most about being at Dentsu is being part of a group of people who believe that digital rights are part of sort of basic human rights. And therefore, we want to make sure that we bring every part of society up to the same level. We don't leave any part of society behind as all the technological and digital advancements in our industry happen. So we're doing a lot of programming and work to make that happen. So, yeah, Dentsu is a, a, a wonderful uh, place to be to work with some great partners. That's great. And Dale, um, you are the SVP of Advertising Partner Success at OpenWeb. Um, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, your role at OpenWeb, and the kind of work you do with us? Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm Dale. I'm SVP Advertising Partner Success here at OpenWeb. Um, prior to OpenWeb, I was one of the co-founders of Ad You Like, which was a company that was acquired by OpenWeb in April 2022. I started my career 20, 23 plus years ago as a journalist and copywriter before kind of moving into content marketing and, and digital advertising. I've spent the best part of my career working alongside uh, advertisers and agency partners ultimately building businesses as as complementary services to them and their their clients at open web i'm I, I lead the the global team overseeing the the day-to-day -day, uh campaign activations and um partner success for for the advertising teams great thanks for joining us yeah. A central theme of the emerging community economy is that every publisher and brand can become, with its community, an economic engine empowered to thrive independently outside the walled gardens. Um, as such, we're going to talk about the importance and the reality of building a strong and loyal community and what that really means in this new context. So in tracking the community economy, we're seeing a new configuration of players emerging. It's publishers and brands interfacing directly with their users to create a more sustainable future for the media industry with the greater user safety and data dignity emphasis. So Angela, a lot of your work at Dentsu is about, as you said, making media more responsible, more sustainable. Um, so first, and you did this a bit, um, but if you go into a little bit more detail, um, how do you really define that? Um, at Dentsu, we define media responsibility as leaving the world in a better state than when we found it. Um, through optimizing, proact proactively optimizing our clients' business. You know, not just coming in and uh, uh, seeking that profit at all costs, but really working with our clients to make sure that we are doing the least harm possible to the planet. And in doing so, bringing people uh, up from, from all walks of life. Um, specifically, this means that we're gonna lean into high quality, transparent inventory. Um, sources that are brand safe. And we also have a zero uh, uh, to zero tolerance policy for ad fraud. Um, there's a huge uh, movement now for bringing equity um, 
to you know accept, making it media accessible for all people so bringing in that diversity of backgrounds of ethnicity of orientation and ability uh, into the work that we do and lastly we are driven to maintain a really high level of privacy compliance for data um, and really analyzing also the environmental effect of our campaigns and helping our clients understand their carbon footprint or other impact that they're having on the world through the media that they're running. So kind of quite a few, quite a few areas to touch on there. Uh, Dale, anything you want to add or follow up? Yeah, you know, I think what you've listed off there is quite a quite a quite a large checklist of of things that, that you know advertisers are, are, are keen to do more with brands are, are keen to understand. How do you how do you kind of position all of all of that advice to to your agents, uh, to your advertising partners. You know, there's quite a big role there. I think for for agencies to to have. Yeah, um, clearly every client's different, and your um, business KPIs with each client is going to be different. But at the heart of it, you're also trying to develop a strategy for them that means that they can achieve their goals in the most sustainable way and without um, doing any damage to, to, to the planet, but also to people, you know, the kind of making sure that we're leveraging all the accredited ver verification partners, working with them for digital campaigns, really trusted and transparent um, programmatic supply partners, making sure, again, that we're in, in partnership, in safe hands. So we're taking that client business and their consumers and making sure we're working with really trusted partners um, in in org audited broadcast environments. You know, n nothing is left yeah. to chance. We're really looking to make sure that everything is, pri you know, privacy is maintained. That there's the right um, trusted environments in which we're running the media, um, yeah, and and going like more than that. Sorry. And I was going to say, and, br and bringing then those diverse own partners and the voices into the conversation, not leaving that to chance, because if you just leave to chance and you don't plan for diverse voices and diverse channels and diverse media partners coming into the media mix, then you're not, you're not going to get it. It won't happen unless you lean into yeah. that and, and bring those you know, to clients. So just, just this last week, I've been working on our kind of D and I go to market for, for open web really and, and how we can, partner with you know community voices from our from a kind of long tail of publishers that, that we work with in these diverse categories and something i'm finding when i'm when i'm speaking to publishers but also when we're speaking to brands really is the, the there's a there's a real worry i think about becoming coming across insincere with with how with how you you how you position stuff when i'm speaking to some of the smaller publishers you know quite often the first thing they'll do is they'll list a number of brands that they don't want to work with because they don't believe in their kind of sincerity in the in the messages that they're trying to push. And when you, when you speak to brands and, and agencies, quite, quite often they, there's there's a there's a will to do well. Everybody wants to to, to kind of you know um, get it right, but there's a fear really of how maybe things may maybe interpreted incorrectly and, and stuff like that. I was just wondering how how do you guide advertisers in in, in that kind of space? It's quite quite a tricky one. Yeah, so that's why a year ago we set up our economic empowerment practice headed by Mark Prince. And so you're bringing in these people who are so sort of accomplished and experienced in this area, and they've grown and grown. And we're 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 guiding our clients through those relationships that they need, through those um, initiatives that will that they will take. So really making sure that everything we're doing is responsible and ethical. Um, and as I say, that that group, that practice, economic empowerment practice, is really leading the way. So bringing in those those experts, so you so yeah. so brands can have an authentic conversation with their consumers, and like they say, not run the risk of seeming inauthentic. I think I think the, the the challenge. This is just my own my own view, really, around kind of that advertising space. Is, is, is some brands sometimes view those D and I initiatives as campaigns rather than actually a, a new way of doing business. Common thread, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that's when you activate a, a one campaign, tick, we're done. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. it, it feels insincere in the market, and I think you know I'm sure Mitch will talk about it a bit 
bit more later on when, when we talk about the, the community economy. I think all of that kind of insincerity is is felt by consumers mm-hmm. these days, and it becomes very much a, a kind of a, a circle of trust in in in, in some ways. I've gone off on a tangent there slightly, it's, but um, no, no. Sometimes you, you have know, you know to I mean, almost. I, think, yeah. <laughs> I do, and and sometimes you have to do a campaign for a client who's having a struggle maybe internally to prove the value of it. And sometimes you need something kind of tangible and, you know, with a beginning and an end and therefore a KPI achieved, et cetera. So one of the things we were doing last year and we've moved uh, with, with the, with the black community, it's called more than this with Gia Peppers. And we actually went out to create that content and P and G came in and Kroger came in and, and, and we're moving it um, into Hispanic as an audience now as well. And that's really helping those, um, diverse voices come through and giving the clients a provable kind of case of, of when you work with some of the, like you said, you're talking about some of the smaller um, partners um, in an authentic way, then it helps, pres- you know, persuade boards or, or senior teams that uh, this is viable. And then you can bring it through as a, as a, as a, yeah, as a through it, thread it becomes, the whole way. Well, you know, do, do you need to do the campaign first or do you need to make the changes first? It's, it's kind of the chicken and egg. Yeah. <laughs> chicken and the eggs to some extent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, um, no, cool. Well, actually right there at the end, um, something that you touched on goes right into this next question. Um, what are some of the key blockers that you've seen in actually bringing this to life? I think there are three main blockers. One that's emerging right now, which is you know the current economic climate means that clients sometimes are looking at very biz, you know focused business driving um, KPI driving solutions, and therefore they might cut back in areas that aren't immediately relatable to their ROAS or whatever. Um, that's one that's emerging at the moment. I think the the two perennial ones are. Um, the lack of or interest in testing opportunities. And the other one would be the sort of just general lack of knowledge of uh, innovations in ad tech. Um, one of the partners we just started working with, I'll give a shout out to my friend, Amy Williams here from Good Loop. Um, you know, a great ad tech idea. Every time someone completes a video watch, charity gets a donation. And um, tech like that, we we are happy to champion and um, uh, you know bring forward to clients because they're, they're, they're doing um, a really interesting take on video completion rates. <laughs> mm. And I know that at OpenWeb, we have a few um, initiatives as well. Um, we we just launched a partnership with Scope3, um, and I believe we have a few others as well. Um, Dale, anything you want to elaborate on there? Uh, yeah, I, th- I think when you... The first point you made there around blockers, I think it, the the economic impact of, of some of these changes is, is stuff that needs to be needs to be felt the the advertising cycle the business cycle is quite often quarterly i think i think that's a challenge for implementing some of these changes potentially it's, it's how do you educate your brands and and advertisers that actually you may not see the results in q1 but you will by the end of q4 or maybe it's you know two, two years down down the line but ultimately if you don't make those investments now you're going to really suffer for them three, four years down, down, down the line. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in all of this, um, another question, who are some of the key stakeholders that brand leaders really need to align um, to move forward this approach? Um, well, from an agency perspective at Dent, so obviously we must have alignment from our clients and the client organizations sort of top leadership, um, it must go, go, you know, you talk about P&G, you just mentioned them, they came in with us on various initiatives, we handle the majority of their media across across the US. And with Mark Pritchard at the helm, you know, you've got a, a strong partner there as a, as a client partner. Um, you know, we, we fundamentally believe that acting responsibly is the right thing to do. And we love working with clients who also share that belief. And they think that is also the right thing to do for the betterment of Yes, we talked about the planet. Yes, we talked about the citizens, but also for this industry and this marketplace that we're working in. You know, we've uh, we've seen so many examples where we've kind of messed up as an industry, and enlightened clients and and agency partners with them are trying to put a lot of that right and and fix things. You mentioned, um, to- you mentioned, you mentioned sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, you mentioned P and G there. Do you? Do, could you? Can, and there are any other advertisers or, or big groups that you think are doing a good job on all of this? 
yeah, working with Kroger, who are definitely leaning in big time on in this area. And um, we're working also with Microsoft um, and, they, and MasterCard. And you look at some of the, the work that they're doing, it's it's tremendous. So yeah, some some inspirational clients that we work with, they really do inspire us to keep pushing ourselves to make uh, you know better initiatives, progress in that area. Cool. Um, so of course, you know, we're having this discussion today because at Open Web, we're seeing this kind of new paradigm, this new economic engine for the open internet emerging. Um, the way we think about it, it's a result of the confluence of like community, uh, trust and safety, day-to-day -day and protections, um, and overall the, the post cookie advertising terrain of the open internet. Um, of course, as we said earlier, we call this the community economy. Um, what I wanted to know, uh, Angela, how do you see this vision of the community economy fitting into the responsible media strategy that we've been talking about? I, it aligns so well. Uh, it's perfectly aligns with our, our, our strategy. We are helping our clients grow and grow in a responsible way. Some, you know, we're even taking green media packages to clients now and really helping them analyze their, their footprint, et cetera. And outside of the client work, you know, we're partnering with all the, you know, all the strategic partnerships you would expect that you would expect with GARM and the Conscious Advertising Network, et cetera, to, to make sure that we're really trying to eliminate hateful and harmful content uh, on the web. So it, it, you, everything you said fits perfectly with our ethical stance and our, our strategy to help both clients, but also to push the industry forward. You know, something myself and Mitch were chatting about in the in the office a few a few days ago was around the kind of cultural moments, and you know, a lot of what it feels like the work of agencies maybe within the the community economy as as it kind of evolves. It, it, it's not re it, it's slightly more reactive to some extent. And how do you how do you kind of um, how do you capitalize on? A cultural moment you know the example we were talking about was, was ocean spray and their TikTok viral from a from a year or two ago you know that that was a that came from the ground up rather than kind of being pushed onto onto consumers from from an advertising agency perspective how, how do you think the the changing world of of media and and an agency land will will kind of evolve as, as we become more of a community economy um, I think, yeah, no, I think, you know, as ever a partnership with the publisher world, the client world, the agencies there, you know, brokering, being being the middleman and bringing new ideas. And I'm looking at the, 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 the move to more and more measurability, looking at attention, you know, kind of oh, let's let's be less less wasteful, you know, so much stuff being pumped out, thousands of ads being pumped out to people every day. Let's be, let's be cleverer, let's let's measure better, let's focus on on, on attention. It's a big project for us at Dent. So you know, are people actually watching this, <laughs> watching stuff yeah. and you know, using again, using tech, using the data to see um how we can help clients spend more efficiently instead of kind of, you know, blasting things out, um, developing yeah, that. As... If we've gone from a an era of where we're creating more and more content, sometimes yeah. some brands are asking themselves, why, why are we creating all of this content if the end result is low levels of engagement or if, if you just mm -hmm. can't get that cut through ultimately because there's just so much content being kind of shared and 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 you know you haven't really got anyone's attention and, and that's ultimately what you're trying to do with, with a lot of with a lot of branded content and, and how you how you push that out so I think you know from from my point of view I can see I use that word from the ground up. It's 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 not user generated content but it kind of mm. is within that community kind of ethos and it is quite quite circular where the brand is host, not hosting the content but is but is involved well, yeah. in the creation of the content or is a sometimes a prop in that content which is created by the community i think where the value for agencies and you know where we don't need to talk about how how often in the last 10 years people have talked about the end of agencies and stuff like that but I, th I think within this economy the role of agencies becomes even more important because it is very much a consultative approach 
in terms of how how do you op operate within that space? How do you measure everything? How do you actually um, kind of influence influence change in in, in that kind of yeah? And the days space. of I think it, yeah. Yeah, as I was say, the days of brands kind of pushing their message down and broadcasting out are clearly gone. And an agency role used to be understand the message the client wants to broadcast, make it, pump it out. Um, clearly now there's a huge, and I'm having so many conversations with different clients about listening, understanding what's happening in the world from your consumer base and people you'd like in your consumer base. And, and and nurturing that and bringing that to the fore. And as an agency, we are kind of custodians and we are, you know, we yes, we're creating content from that. But like you say, a lot of it is swelling up from, from co the consumer base um, rather than a top-down approach. And in doing yeah. so, you then as an agency have to be super, with partners, with tech partners, have to be super careful because you don't know what's coming next. You know, you can, you know, you're, you're, um, you, yeah. you, you're not you don't want to be a policeman but at the same time you've got to protect what's coming out of um you know influencers and the consumers in general to make sure that it remains brand safe and safe for consumers too so yeah. um yeah and then you've got to i think you've got to make sure that the brand messaging speaks to those consumers in the right way it, it's comes yep. back to sincerity i think and, and building yes. building that trust within the community and i suppose lastly hopefully we've reached the point where advertisers that you know i probably spent the last 10 years explaining to advertisers when the, when you get a brief it would be good if we could if we if this could go viral you know it's um hopefully we've we've all realized that we can't do that <laughs> exactly you know the, the 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 ocean spray example that was you know something that was very much um from the community ocean spray didn't plan that i think the amount of times working with agencies and working with advertisers where they're scratching their heads about how they can make something go viral you know i think that's that's something that we can hopefully say goodbye to in terms of the the, the community economy absolutely on, on a number of levels because yeah. sometimes now it's more interesting for a client to be with a dozen <laughs> or a couple of hundred really targeted uh consumers uh -huh. who they want to get that that particular point of view from another consumer into their into the hands of rather than you know broadcasting to millions yes of course you know some of the big brands we were they still want their reach and their frequency etc but they're more interested in people are, are people actually watching it and how, you know are they watching it on two screens what where are they what are they doing how do how does that mix work where does my ne next best dollar go um but also um uh, just that whole era of like you say let's make something I mean, a number of times we had a brief yeah. you know let's go viral it's like no 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 it's not for you to decide <laughs> the uh the society <laughs> exactly. out there will decide yeah do, do yeah. you think we'll reach a point where where we'll we'll have the opposite where every brief will I do not want this to go viral I'm <laughs> small I keep it keep it niche within my community <laughs> For some brands, maybe yes, yeah. For some, still they'll want to they'll want, they'll want the, the the big audiences. I wonder, um, just as a follow up to some of that, um, how do you feel about attention metrics? Uh, just generally speaking, I know this is a relatively uh, new sort yeah. of way to way to measure. So, yeah, I mean, hot topic right now. Who everybody's jockeying for position on who's going to be the new. Uh, attention metric purveyor um, Nielsen or with Nielsen one, or is it going to be a combination of other, other players coming in? And we're working with several um, and we are, and clients are very interested in testing and learning at the moment. So it's very fluid. I would, I would say it's definitely the, the top, one of the key topics at the moment, I would say, with so certainly we've, with we've the media just, clients. We've just integrated. Sorry, we've we've just integrated across our kind of SSB um, Adelaide attention metrics. So yes, yes, we work with Adelaide. We're pushing too. more, yep. but but again, again, that's a um, it's a response from the market ultimately. Is the the way we're facilitating that. So you know, again, again, I think that's the kind of agency influence on on brands and and their advertisers in terms of kind of position in this stuff you know how do you measure this these elements yeah so, uh, well we've done a couple of tests we did a couple of we did a test with a big beer brand and again kroger have just come in and done some really interesting testing buying on attention not on reach you know so 
actually paying for the eyeball that looked at your ad, not paying for the eyeball that was in the room, but looking at the navel or whatever, how, <laughs> looking at their phone. How much of a, you know, from, we're very much on the activation point of the, the digital ad ecosystem. Mm -hmm. when, it, when it comes to um, educating advertising, advertisers, clients, you know, internal and external kind of stakeholders. How much of a challenge do you think it is to to move the whole industry away from reach and scale and impressions and CTRs as the as the kind of the go-to? Yeah. Work? Well, we've been on this journey for five years at Dentsu. So we published the attention economy. We started publishing and talking about it five years ago. And so this year, Clearly, um, you, with all the industry noise surrounding it, it's become a massive topic. So we've got a lot of learning already uh, under our belt. And I think I think the tipping point was this year, to be honest, we were knocking on that door for quite a while. And I think it's opened now and every every client, every advertiser wants to wants to hear about it. It's it's there are you know, many voices in that debate. So it's not clear um sometimes. Um what to believe but i think denso has a really strong point of view as i say we because we've been on that particular mm -hmm. theme for five years now so yeah it's it's the doors open i think every client's interested in it i think they realize that um the time for just you know the dots on the <laughs> the dots on the plan it, it is over and, and a much more and, you know and also they're often a lot of these clients are now sitting on some amazing valuable first party data um, and with all the different, um, you know, new newer ways of, of addressing those consumers, um, that's exciting. I mean, it's it's hugely more complicated than when we used to just buy <laughs> reach and frequency exactly. and, and, <laughs> and and push down the content like we were just talking about. You know, now you can have all sorts of um, uh, content created bespoke, can't you? So yeah, it's it's more complicated. Therefore, I think there's still a role for agencies. Um, uh, death of the agency is a long way off in my personal view, but uh, yeah. So I think it's I think that particular attention debate is definitely the hot topic, and the doors wide open now for, for for advertisers to to listen and test test. Just you know, we're saying times just test your way into it. Test test and learn, and um, a lot of the big guys are. That's exactly what I was thinking uh, while, you, while you both were talking about this. Um, we've talked about responsible media. We've talked about sustainable media and green media. We've talked about attention um, as a new way to measure all of this. And all of these, um, they come with their own new ways to measure, new considerations. And we talked a bit about aligning different stakeholders internally at brands. Um, and I just wonder, like, uh, for, you know, Today, this 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 is a. There are a lot of new things to handle and think about. As you said, this creates a great role for agencies to help sort that out. I wonder what you think is next, um, it, or maybe you know, future casting is too too dangerous a sport, uh, <laughs> which I totally understand. Well, yeah, I think one big thing, obviously, with the cookie going away and clients some scrambling some some feeling confident because they're sitting on this huge wealth of first party data and some of them are desperately trying to create that i think that's that's the exciting thing for me in the future is knowing that you know big brand i think of i work with nestle and knowing that that we can start to help them see that the woman that's buying the cat food is also a soccer mom buying the um, you know the, the the treats for the for their kid, after, and 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 understanding that shopper behavior that's mixed with the consumer behavior um, across their whole portfolio, because suddenly their data will start to really sing. That that then I get I get excited about. Um, I get excited about clients developing products that are better for the planet. Um, you know, when you look at kind of washing powders or washing liquids that are are less harmful or the way that they're dispensed or packaging options and stuff and then how we can use that to help consumers change their behavior um so i'm i, I love the fact that advertising still has a power to change consumer behavior if you get it right and if clients are doing the product innovation, we can use the media and the uh, advertising world innovation 
to to change consumer behavior for the good that that again you know if we're crystal ball future those are the two things that i think are exciting data and pure innovation in the sense of doing better in the world dale anything you want to add there obviously we're we've just just last month or, or or two months ago kind of entered the the age of ai so i think we probably have to think about that elephant in the room and how that is going to impact everything we've talked about over the next kind of decade or so you know how how it will change exactly what will what will remain the same it's yet to be seen but I, I think there's you know when we talk about data data processing adding machine learning to add scale to these types of uh, data sets where you can you know then potentially create relevant ads bespoke to you on the fly in real time you know all of all of those kind of things are probably not too far on the horizon in terms of um, how we operate around them I do think there probably is a bit more of a trend within that because you can scale so easily to go small if that makes sense you know what you're talking about the niche mm -hmm. targeting the niche communities i think there's um there's definitely something more granular that will come from that in terms of the advertising messages that we push out because you'll have the technology that will be able to create multiple versions for every every kind of audience that you're you're looking to target um but it's too much of an unknown, in all honesty, to, to see what that looks like in the, in the not too distant future. Didn't the AI thing come like really quickly? Was that just me? I mean, it was there. It was always Very there, quickly. wasn't it? All mm. through 21, 22, you know, it was kind of, and suddenly start 23, I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Okay. So we've got our, like our latest, we don't have a Dentsu Navigator report comes out every month. And this month it's about AI and the rise and what consumers yeah. are actually thinking about it. And it's like, Wow, that one that one came fast. Um and obviously yeah, and with, I think at the start. With with AI, you know, obviously working in in tech, in advertising, there's there's a new innovation every every other day, or it feels like, you know, especially if you if you read the press releases. So, you know, sometimes the hype is way beyond mm -hmm. the, the tech. But I think whenever when everybody started using chat GPT, they were like, actually, this is quite good this is pretty good <laughs> this is, this is, exactly yeah, yeah. This, yeah. This, this actually does what it says yeah so i, I think the mm -hmm. the kind of mind starts to race then in terms of the the opportunities that you can get um with chat gpt and, and kind of all the other innovations that are out there but in, again that, that's an opportunity i think for, for businesses to advise brands in of how you should use all of this tech and how, how it should be implemented yeah and it comes back to that thing i was talking about at the beginning which is in all this great advancement, all these things that are happening, we've got to make sure that we don't leave a chunk of our society. Talk about responsible media and responsible, you know, being responsible in our industry. Don't leave a big chunk of our society behind. You know, we've we, people should the in society, people should have the right to keep up with digital advancements. It should be like a, a basic human right, and they should have a chance to participate in all that and not be for the few. So uh, I think anything that we as industry bodies, as, as participants in the industry can do to bring all of society with us and give, give people the opportunity, I think that's a really good uh, thing to keep, keep in mind as we race with all this new, fast, um, often AI-driven technology. I agree, yeah. And I wonder, actually, on that note, um, where do you... Uh, AI came on and organically grew very popular very quickly and became, you know, the talk of the entire industry and many industries across tech. Um, this, you know, if you remember, actually, it was just a couple of months earlier before AI really came onto the scene earlier this year that everyone was talking about the metaverse. Um, and I think the two are probably related um, and will be more interrelated in the future. Um but but this all of this talk about AI has sort of displaced our our conversation about the metaverse. And I wonder now thinking back to it and what you were just saying about responsible media um, and the idea that access to um, and the ability to really use uh, different, you know, tech innovations across all of society. How do you, how would you see the metaverse fitting into something like that? Because at least in its current iteration, it requires, you know, a three hundred dollar piece of equipment. Um and I just, I just wonder, you know, um, what do you think about that? Or is it maybe something more for the future? Yeah, I think everybody, all the early adopters came on, didn't they? And, and there was lots of excitement. And then, 
like you say, there's a barrier to entry in terms of the cost. And so I think that the 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 curve will be slower. There'll be a slower burn on, on the adoption curve than something like AI where you, you you can see the immediate and widespread uses for it, some of which university professors, et cetera, are not exactly delighted about. But there's a there's a there's a quicker on ramp to it. There's a less cost prohibited barrier to it and um, a, a lot of um, yeah, options to use, you know, opportunities to use it. So something like that, I think, is going to um, is is easily going to pass into society quicker than. The, but the metaverse is 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 taking its uh, it, yeah, its place on media plans. You know, we took Heineken into the metaverse for the uh, virtual brewery, etc. So you know, there's stuff being built. Um, it's just going to be a slower burn. Yeah, and is there still lots of interest uh, among clients? Sorry. Yes, I think so. Um, a lot of the we, we work with a lot of those big clients. I'm not sure about smaller or medium clients, but the big clients we work with are putting their stake into the metaverse. Literally, like here is my brewery, here is my store, here is my concert, here is my experience, etc. So yes, there's still a lot of um, interest. It's definitely a part of, of of a media plan of a marketing plan um i think that people are getting a better handle on who's who's in the metaverse who the, who they're now targeting um, and they're often the people that they really want to be those thought leaders so yeah there's still a there's still a uh, a part of is part of the plan still a place for it yeah it's am i right in saying it's probably a, a nice to have rather than an, an essential on a media plan at this, at this stage i think that's that's when you depends hit a, a on point. which brand yes i mean that's you know for some of the luxury brands where they are you know it, word of mouth and the and the reputation and things that they can drive through that pr coming out of the metaverse it's, it's a bigger part it's more important than perhaps you know a cpg brand for sure yeah Okay. You know, I think interestingly, you, you mentioned education there when we were talking about AI, and I think maybe mm. that's where uh, there, there's some barriers to the metaverse in terms of, um, you know, there's gatekeepers, you need to build the build build the tech, build the infrastructure, but with with education, you know, that, that that's an obvious disruptor open to, to, to be used to create kind of more online learning facilities so you're talking there about kind of inclusion and the, the barrier to entry in terms of the 300 dollars for the headset cost yeah. imagine if you could access a, a harvard degree for 300 300 dollars you know or, or or join those those classes there's there's a kind of there's tech bringing down the cost which i think at the moment maybe we're seeing institutions with vested interests hanging mm. back from from those but you know if we go forward yeah. As the mother of two college kids, I am feeling the pain of college education prices, yes. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's something um, Professor Galloway, one of the investors in, in Open Web, talks about quite a lot, actually, about the yeah. spiralling cost of, of kind of college education. But, okay. um, yeah, I, you know, I think I think those, that, that's the really exciting part of the metaverse, I think, in, in, the, in the future is mm -hmm. how it really impacts kind of day-to-day -to -day life today. Mm -hmm. in the future will will be transformed by some of those kind of initiatives. Certainly hope so. <laughs> yeah. All right. You've been listening to The Community Exchange, an open web podcast that tracks the emerging community economy by talking to the leaders, bringing it to life. Uh, my guest today was Angela Johnson, the Client Development Officer at Dentsu. Angela, thanks so much for your time and for sharing your insights. Uh, everyone else, join us next time on The Community Exchange. We'll see you then.